Thanks for joining us here on the Audrain Museum Network. If you like the videos that we put out here, and we know you do, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when we post new content. Thanks for being here with us. Hi, and welcome back to the Adrain Museum Network. I'm Donald Osborne, and we're here in the gallery of the Adrain Automobile Museum of Newport, Rhode Island, in our exhibition, Early Landmarks in Automotive Engineering. To take a slightly more in-depth look at some of the early cars in the exhibition, I'm joined by Alex Cull, our museum coordinator. Hi, Alex. How you doing, Donald? Excellent, thank you very much. As we said in our introduction video, this show really covers an amazing range of development and, and innovation in cars. 50 years, unlike any other we have seen and are likely to see again. And we're starting with the very first car, the earliest car in this exhibition, this 1886 Benz Potten Motorwagen replica. None of the original Benz Potten Motorwagens still exist, but the small series was built in 1986 by John Bentley Engineering of the UK on behest of Mercedes-Benz to celebrate the centenary of this car. And they did a small series after that, and this is one of those replica cars built in exactly the same way that Carl Benz built his in 1886. And what's so special about this particular car in the history? Well, like you said, maybe the first car. There's a lot of debate around that because people were tinkering in garages, they were building their own little motorized bikes and motorized scooters and stuff like that. But he was kind of the first one to put it into production and patent it, most importantly. And that's where the title of the first car, or at least the first patented car with an internal combustion engine comes from. And it's a very interesting thing. Um, We'll talk about this a little later in another video when we speak about the Ford Model T, but patents and automobiles are a very interesting story as well. Mm -hmm. There was something which, if you haven't heard about this, I recommend highly you do some research on, the Selden patent. So when cars were being introduced and developed, a number of people attempted to actually patent the idea of an automobile. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl Benz's patents were very specific for what they did in terms of the drivetrain for the, for the uh, vehicle, this internal combustion uh, engine. Yep. And it's very interesting because the reason why we have this car in the exhibition is that other people built cars. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci invented what might be a car back in 1478. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, Cugnot built a steam yep. car in 1865. Mm -hmm. But what is this? This is the first practical application of a car as something more than a laboratory toy or something you sort of tooled around in. Mm -hmm. Bertha Benz is really the reason why this car is here. Yes. And the fact that this incredibly pioneering woman, the wife of Carl Benz, mm -hmm. took this vehicle on a 111 mile round trip mm -hmm. from Mannheim to Pforzheim, her hometown, with her two sons, with two of her sons, I should say, they had three. Um, they might have had more if he didn't spend so much time with his car, but that's another story. Um, to, to make this trip in what certainly seemed something incredibly outlandish. Well, I think it's a, a really good example of designer versus the person who uses the product. Because Carl was tinkering away, trying to make it perfect. And Bertha said, we got to prove that it works. So she rolled it out of the factory one morning without him knowing. Maybe the first person to steal a car at that point. <laughs> With her two sons, drove it 60 miles to her mother's hometown, then drove it back 50 miles the next day. She was the one who invented the brake pad. Halfway there, she was having trouble stopping. She had a cobbler put some leather on the brake band, the first ever brake pad. And when she got home, she said it was really struggling on the hills. They had to push it uphill. So he installed another gear to make it go easier up hills. So she was the one who actually had the practical know-how or the experience to tell Benz what it needed. And it's also one of those things that, as the automobile developed, and we'll see in this exhibition, how practicality uh, played a part in making it a more mass market item. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that uh, makes this vehicle stand out is the fact that Carl Benz built a number of them. There were a lot of people, as you said, who were great bicycle engineers, mm -hmm. uh, some steam engine people that built vehicles. They'd build one, mm -hmm. they'd build two. Mm -hmm. They say, okay, fine, I've had enough of this. But Carl Benz persevered and built a number of cars. Mm -hmm. And so he really sort of also started the idea of the car as business. Yep. Um, he ended up uh, licensing a lot of his engines to be used in other vehicles mm -hmm. and uh, sort of 
was the, the father, in a way, of the internal combustion vehicle like this. The next Benz vehicle had four wheels. And mm -hmm. in fact, one of the reasons why uh, none of the original Benz Pottenwagens exists is for the very purpose of development. Who thought of these vehicles as historical objects? They were tools. They were an idea to get into business to sell vehicles. And so the early tricycles were converted to four-wheel cars, mm -hmm. which of course became the practical uh, business application of them. And it's also a very interesting thing when you look at this, because there are a lot of cars, as a matter of fact, one we're about to see, uh, that look very much like a carriage, yep. a horseless carriage. This is interesting because it doesn't look like a carriage. It actually looks like a bicycle, mm -hmm. to your point about the, um, the early bicycle builders. And we had another show here at the Audrain, and you can check out the video on that show called Balance and Power, the World on Two Wheels. And we see in that show an early tricycle, and it's very similar to this vehicle. And so you see that interchange between the various uh, modes of transportation, which we'll also examine in this show later on when we talk about the motorcycles in this show. Mm -hmm. So th there's so much interactivity at this point and so much invention. It's just absolutely amazing. With other names you might recognize like Maybach and Daimler at the very same time working on internal combustion engines. And while Benz never met Maybach, you know, their companies, their companies all kind of wound up together eventually because of their close proximity in, in Germany. Consolidation is another theme <laughs> that we'll, we'll touch on in the show. It, I, I feel like a fool because I'm just, I'm just laughing hysterically because it's just so much ground to cover here and, and so many really exciting things. And of course, uh, in an episode of Mansions and Motor Cars, Jay Leno and I ride in this car. He's driving, I'm the passenger. Um, and it's really fascinating to imagine this car is not very powerful, it's not very fast. Three quarters of a horsepower, yep. top speed of perhaps 10 miles per hour. Downhill. Downhill. But it was amazing to think of the fact that at this time, people got everywhere either on a horse or walking. Most people walked places, mm -hmm. especially if you lived in the country, you were very used to walking. And when we were driving this vehicle on, uh, at Hammersmith Farm, we were riding past a paddock of polo horses. And they heard this thing chugging along, and they all turned their heads. And as one, they all ran away much like the scene might have been in 1886 or 1887. A, a, lot of the, a lot of the reasons why cars didn't catch on eventually were some of the laws had prevented them from doing that, and putting top speeds on them or noise regulations because they didn't want to scare the horses. And that's another great thing here at the Audrain. We have the uh, Audrain Newport Bristol Newport Veteran Car Tour, which you can also watch a video about here on the Audrain Museum Network. And that celebrates cars built between the turn of the century and 1907. And the idea that people were suddenly on these, what must have seemed like magic carpets. I mean, you're gliding through the air at five, six, seven miles per hour as if, as if with no effort. Yep, and you don't have to feed it and they don't get tired. Exactly. <laughs> so let's look at a next step forward, indeed, a leap forward mm -hmm. in early cars. Let's take a look. Let's go. And we've gone from the 1886 Benz Potten Motorwagen to what is a car which has an unmistakable and irreplaceable place in the history of the car. Mm -hmm. And it's not one that many people think about. This is a 1904 Curve Dash or Model R Oldsmobile. Now, everybody who knows ancient cars is familiar with the Curve Dash Olds. They've certainly seen one. Mm -hmm. They know the place that Oldsmobile played in popular culture the great song, In My Merry Oldsmobile. Or REO Speedwagon. Exactly. Uh, a little later. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what's really interesting is the fact that most people think that the Ford Model T was the first mass-produced car. Yep. But in fact... It was not. And it wasn't the first car made on a production line either. This was. Exactly. So there was a fire at the factory. They were making 11 different models. And then there was only one model left. This was the one that survived the fire. But that's not why they produced it necessarily it was kind of the, just the easiest car to produce. And they ordered all the parts from surrounding factories, delivered them to the surviving building in the factory, and they assembled them there. That's where the final assembly took place, and that's the first assembly line. Now, it wasn't moving like Ford's was, but that's where the idea started. And uh, Ransomy Olds also was brilliant in that this is not only the first mass-produced car, it's the first mass-produced car because it was made with interchangeable parts. Um, and that's something which is a very important thing. As we mentioned before about Carl Benz tinkering in his workshop, 
That's what most automobile production was. Every piece was unique. When you get to Ransom Olds and the Model R, the runabout, he was able to build almost 20,000 copies of the same car because he knew that all the parts would fit a different car. And it also allowed it to become something of a popular phenomenon because people began to see these cars in more than just small numbers. Um, the, uh, the fascinating thing about this car as well is uh, I drove this car uh, along with Rupert Banner of Bonhams, mm -hmm. the sponsor of the uh, Adrain Veteran Car Tour, in the 2022 uh, Bristol, Newport, Bristol, Newport Tour, and it was absolutely fantastic. This car is also known for the ease of controls. Uh, you started from inside the car, so you didn't have to get out of the car and crank it. Um, the spark and advance controls were very easy to operate, and it was basically a single lever and the tiller and off you went. And the, one of the, the ideas of this car that Olds had was he wanted it to be easily repairable, to repair it in a bike shop or a blacksmith shop in your local town. It was one of the first cars that was priced so that a middle class family could afford it. I think $650 or so. $650, which we have to put into perspective. Mm -hmm. $650 today is like a really fancy dinner out. <laughs> <laughs> or a, a week's paycheck. Or a week's paycheck. Yep. Um, it was much more than a house might have cost mm -hmm. uh, back in, making, in 1902, 1903. Most people are making that in a year, perhaps. Correct, exactly. Um, but nonetheless, compared to the vehicles which had come earlier, this was an absolute miracle, the fact that you could actually get a car for this price. Now, another interesting thing, um, we chat chatted about the fact that the uh, Benz Patton Motorwagen looked like a tricycle bicycle. This truly, if you ask someone to draw a horseless carriage, you draw a curved dash Oldsmobile because you can just imagine this with a horse attached to the front. Definitely. Uh, one of my favorite stories about this car is um, to prove the durability. He had uh, Roy Chapin, who went on to found Hudson Motor Company, drive this car from Detroit to New York, 700 miles, did it in seven days, only used 30 gallons of fuel with 30 gallons of water for cooling. But that's almost 25, 26 miles per gallon in 1901, I think they, I did, they did it, which is pretty good MPGs. Not bad at all. And, and the fact that, again, going from what Bertha Benz had to go through to travel those 60 miles from Mannheim to Pforzheim, mm -hmm. the fact that you could, by 1902 and 1903, make a journey like that in a motor vehicle was astounding. And again, another example of the incredible pace of development that we're seeing at this time. Yep. Um, one of the other things that we'll talk about next is the fact that the generally, the, the generally accepted propulsion system for cars was hardly set. We've so far spoken about two internal combustion fuel-powered cars, but there were alternatives back then, and steam and electric power were really important to the early car scene. So let's talk about one of the other cars in the exhibition, which is an 1899 Crouch steam car. Now, this is an interesting vehicle because it's the oldest car in the Audrain collections, and it's also extremely rare. Crouch made internal combustion gasoline or kerosene-powered cars. They made one or two of them, I think. But they made only three steam cars, mm -hmm. and this is the only one of those three that they made which still exists. Yep. And it's also very interesting because it's a double acting steam engine and that provided so much more efficiency in the steam process. Uh, when, one of the unique things about his car was the, the fire was not automatic like some other cars, but the water was. So you didn't have to constantly fill with water. That was done by a type of like siphon and float system. So that was kind of what set his car apart innovation wise. <laughs> and unfortunately, like many early car manufacturers, he was very, very clever. His cars were very well made but not many of them sound, found customers, and he was out of business very quickly. I think Columbia might have purchased his company. Exactly. And it's, it's a testament to the fact that steam power had a great deal of appeal over an internal combustion engine simply for smoothness. Mm -hmm. the, early, this, the, the Oldsmobile with a single cylinder, the Benz single cylinder, uh, some of the other two-cylinder cars of the time were powerful, but really, really rough. I think we're going to cover smoothness in another video. Exactly. And now we'll see the incredible pace of development this time in the automobile going from 1904 to 1910 and literally a completely new world. This is my favorite car. <laughs>
So from 1904 to 1910. Now, in 1904, there were a lot of very powerful and fast cars. Sure. But when you think about cars for the road, now, the Oldsmobile, as you mentioned, was an affordable, upper-middle-class car. Mm -hmm. The American Underslung was not for the middle classes. This is a really expensive car, advertised for the select few. <laughs> and there were fewer and fewer people that actually bought them. But an extraordinary car. Um, 1910, we're now at 60 horsepower. Whoa. This is a 70 mile per hour car. And one of the reasons why it's here in this exhibition is the fact that the construction of this car, now there's a, a tale which I think is probably apocryphal about the first underslung being made because the chassis were delivered and they were stacked upside down for shipment. They thought, hmm, that's interesting. Let's try to put that on the car. I think not. Um, uh, Harry Stutz was behind this car, so he's somebody who knew a lot about building a strong, fast car. And so, in addition to the frame being uh, lower than the springs, mm -hmm. it also allowed the, the body to be set lower into the frame so that the center of gravity was much lower, so the handling was a revelation for the time. And also, just from a design perspective, and I love design, 1910, you would not have a car with a hood lower than the fenders again until after World War II. Well, the fact that this car is only six years apart from the Oldsmobile we just looked at is remarkable. It's like a spaceship compared to that thing. And they said that 70 miles an hour in this car with these tires, I, I don't know if I'd like to do that, but I'd love to see it do it. Um, I don't know what to say about this car besides it's beautiful. The paint is remarkable, it's pristine. It looks like almost it's been printed out of a machine. <laughs> well, I mean, I have to say, this, this is a car uh, which is certainly one of the jewels of the Adrain collection. And yes, it is extremely well restored. In fact, this car won its class at the 2014 Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. And it's probably finished to a level a bit higher than most of the cars that were used on the road, but not higher than the level that they might have prepared a car for an auto show. This was a very expensive car, built for a very discerning clientele, always very carefully built, but a car meant to drive. Uh, Jay and I drove this car in an episode of Mansions of Motor Cars, which you can see here on the Audrain Museum Network, and it is just an astonishing thing. It covers the ground so effortlessly. And again, thinking about the fact that cars were still new, a lot of people had yep. never seen a car yet, and to go at these speeds in a car like this with this kind of performance just a few decades after the invention of the motor car is just another example of the astounding progress that cars were making in this period. We said we have the Oldsmobile here, which is very much, like we said, a horseless carriage. It has a carriage seat, the tiller style steering. This is the beginnings to me of when you have that car look the bucket seats, the steering wheel, the way the body and the fenders are laid out. This is the beginning of car design. Absolutely, 100%. And when we see our next phase, where we see the combination of power and a development in engine technology that could not be imagined back in 1886, you'll really be amazed. Come join us.